He kōna e purangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Voice of Tangaroa is a collaboration between New Zealand Geographic and RNZ. Reporting for this series is public interest journalism funded through New Zealand On Air. I'm at Orderly's uh, Erect Crested Penguin Colony. It's, it's just spectacular. I mean, I've, I can't find the right words. I'm surrounded by black and white with a few golden sprinkles in it. It's just surreal. Kia ora anō. Welcome back to Voice of Tangaroa. Ko Klerken Kanan Tene, producer and presenter of RNZ's Our Changing World. And for today's episode, I'm joined by a member of the New Zealand Geographic team, James Frankham. Kia ora. Hello. Yes, I'm the publisher and director of New Zealand Geographic, but sometimes I get let out of the office. And you've got a story for us. That's right. It's a, it's a tale of the wild Southern Ocean, remote rocky islands, high-tech equipment, tens of thousands of penguins, and one big mystery to solve. Let's start aboard the expedition yacht, the Avoe. We're already far out to sea, and here University of Otago ecologist and Tawaki Project co-leader Dr Thomas Matten is filling me in on the history of our destination. Well, the, the bounties were discovered by one William Bly, um, and they were named after the boat that is very well known for the mutiny on the bounty. And he described them as just barren rocks that were covered in snow. So Captain Bly came across the islands in September 1788, The infamous mutiny happened about seven months afterwards. And when you look at his logbooks, you can see he doubted his original snow assessment, suggesting maybe it was patches of white marble instead. But it's actually um, seabird guano. Uh, But unlike the the, the islands off South America, for example, where the guano just builds up and becomes this sought-after fertilizer, it never has a chance to do that on the bounties because of the sheer exposure to the wind and the sea. So instead the guano is is sort of polished into every crack and every crevice in the rock and it forms this ice rink-like surface that when it's wet it gets really slippery. This is the key characteristic of the Bounty Islands. It might not have soil, trees, plants, except for a little patch of cooked scurvy grass, but what it does have is birds, squillions of birds, including Thomas's favourite kind, penguins. There are 18 penguin species on this planet and only four of them are rated endangered. Of these four endangered species, two are endemic to the New Zealand region. New Zealand is a bit of a penguin hotspot. 13 of the 18 species have been recorded here, nine breed in our territory, including those two endangered ones, the hoiho, or yellow-eyed penguin, and the tawaki narahi, the erect crested penguin. And we know very little about erect crested penguins. In fact, apart from a few surveys that counted them or tried to count them and just descriptive uh, stuff, you know, what they look like, we know nothing about these. Which is why we're on the Avoe, headed to the Bounty and Antipodes Islands, a full three days sailing southeast of Dunedin and where the erect crested penguins breed and where a stark contrast between how these two populations of birds are faring is beginning to show an alarming pattern. When you arrive at the Bounty Islands, everything sort of hits you at once. The tooth-like shapes of the sheer cliffs, the sheen of the polished guano-coated rocks, you know, the water dotted with the streamlined penguin bodies, the sky filled with gliding albatrosses. There are turns overhead, there are shags on the rocky ledges. But you also get hit by the smell, even by the sound, and even from a distance. There are no sheltered bays or coves, and the easiest island to land on is Proclamation Island. But that doesn't mean it's easy. From the dinghy, it's an undignified sort of leap onto a rock platform. And then along a sheer-sided path, then you're hauling up gear and helping people and dodging any seals along the way. You do find yourself clinging to poo, like you've never clung to poo before. And then once at the top, it hits you again. We've managed to scramble up the side of the hill now at Proclamation Island and pick our way through our penguins and albatross that are just 
cloaking this hillside, there's probably a penguin or an albatross every 800 millimetres <laughs> spread out in a very even fashion, pretty much out of beak range of each other. It appears to be a very competitive environment, <laughs> with incoming albatross pecking their way through uh, the mix. And other mollymorks, as they fly in from sea, come careening over the top of the ridges and you physically have to duck your head to miss them and the, you feel a rush of wind as they go past. Describe the characters for us, James. What do these birds look like? Well, there's salvins and mollymorks everywhere, and that's sort of a, a I guess you'd call it a medium-sized albatross, but a bit like saying it's a medium-range giant. I, I don't think I could wrap my arms around one of them, but they're very dignified-looking birds. They've got a silver head and a sort of a yellow, lemony kind of beak and a smudge of eyeshadow over the top. And these dignified birds are sitting there on these mounds of poo oh, and mud and sticks and other bits and pieces glued together. And they, they all sort of look like they're sitting on these terracotta pots I suppose and because there's not much to work with here there's no soil at all many of the nests are actually made out of bits of bird as well there's feathers and vertebrae and it, I even saw a whole leg sticking out of one of them and they're loud so in between every one of the Salvin's albatross are the erect crested penguins and they're about half a metre high and weigh about four kilos and they're, they're handsome looking penguins on top of the head is this golden quiff of feathers that sort of blows around in the wind like a bad comb over. They're also loud. I visit with Thomas in November 2022. It's the perfect time to count breeding pairs, which will be looking after the eggs on the nest, and the team gets right to work because the weather window has only allowed us two working days on the island. So we've got uh, a couple of drones that are flying pre-programmed missions along grid lines so that we get photogrammetry data for all the different islands. Um, so basically it's, it's a series of single images that then get stitched together into one big image um, and that can also be used to record three-dimensional data of you know, the topography of, of each of the uh, islands. The thing that is a bit difficult is that we've got so many albatross in there, so we have to be very careful not to interfere with those guys while they're zooming around. So we're generally f flying about 20 metres above the albatross layer, so to speak. So they've got to watch out for the albatrosses, and obviously weather can disrupt drone flying. But there are a lot of advantages too. Yeah, from this vantage point on top of Proclamation Island, the team can fly drones out over each one of the 22 rock stacks and islands that make up the Bounties group and they capture incredible detail. Every little rock shows up. This uh, giant photograph is made out of uh, 700, 800, up to 1,000 individual images that are, what, 20 megapixels each. You've got a very high-resolution uh, photograph of each island, and you can zoom into centimeter levels, which allows us to, to count each and every bird, penguin, albatross, even uh, former primates on this image. So uh, we get a very very accurate census and, and count of, of all the birds on the Bounty Islands. The birds were manually counted from these images, a total of 27,800 breeding pairs. And this is the first important piece of information, an accurate and reproducible assessment of how many penguins there are. Because counts in the past have varied wildly. Ah, oh, yeah. I spoke with Thomas about this on his latest expedition to the Bounty Islands in January. The earliest assessments of the bounties, I'm pretty convinced now, they were way off. There was in the late 1970s when there was an expedition here that looked at the albatross and on the site they counted a few penguins in an, in an area and then extrapolated the nest density to the entire um, archipelago and they, they came up with 115,000 breeding pairs. And if, if you look around, we're, we're looking at, at an island group that ho currently holds 28,000 breeding pairs. Now try to imagine where would the other 100, almost 100,000 breeding pairs go? There's just no room for it. But it's the problem if you extrapolate from a tiny area to a large area, you've got this massive error in it. But the problem is this number entered the official records. So when the first scientific, properly done ground count was done here, and they only found around 30,000 uh, 30, breeding pairs. 
it meant you had this one data point from the 1970s, which with 115,000, and 20 years later it was down to 30,000, which means, okay, this, this population is on its way out. But I think the plot thickens and they were just way off back then. Because I visited later in the summer, you can hear extra layers of sound going on. Big, fluffy albatross chicks on the chimney pot nests that make this weird, almost creepy clacking sound as you go past. And penguin chicks cheeping any time an adult comes near, in the hopes they might get fed. This is what's called the postcard phase, as University of Otago ecologist and the other Tawaki project co-leader, Dr Ursula Ellenberg, explains. Um, penguins, when they hatch, they can't thermoregulate, so they get quite cold when there's not a, an adult sitting on them, and that's what we call guard stage. There's always an adult on the chick to guard it. And postcard means when they're big enough, they're big and, big and fluffy and um, can look after themselves, start to make friends with neighboring chicks from little creches, and then... They don't need to be guarded by an adult anymore, hence postcard. They go and look after themselves uh, while both adults go out and find some food for them because these chicks, they grow fast and they want a lot to eat. Whereas a guard stage chick is quite little um, and doesn't need a lot of food just regularly. So one partner can happily supply enough food for a chick. But now it's... All, all hands on deck to keep those chicks fed. Now that I look around, I can see what you mean about the creches. There's like little groups of chicks and only a few chubby adults around, but way more chicks than adults. Yeah. And they, they take their chances. Like they'll um, approach any adult uh, that passes by and hope for a feed and bag and back. And sometimes... Um, they can sneak a, a meal like that. <laughs> so you've got to be really careful as an adult who you're feeding. We've got a perfect day, sunny with light winds. But the weather forecast tells us there's a storm coming, which means the team has just six hours on the island to get a whole bunch of things done. One of which is replacing the trail cameras they put out across the island more than a year ago. Try again with a, with a fresh set of cameras to get, to get the same data and then hopefully compare the attendance patterns uh, at the colony between those two years, whether there are differences or whether they are the same. I mean, usually crested penguins are very accurate. They use day length to um, determine when they start breeding. So we would expect that the penguins do the same thing year in, year out. But we already see that the birds here are about three to four weeks later than the ones on the Antipodes. So the day length, I don't know, maybe there, there are different factors at play. So hopefully the, the time-lapse camera data will, will give us some further clues what's happening here. These cameras take a picture every hour during daylight, which means a lot of pictures. But Thomas uses a citizen science platform called Penguin Watch. He'll upload the images and volunteers will go through and annotate the pictures. I mean, we, we probably will be looking at about I don't know, 100,000 images altogether. Uh, the last time when we uploaded data to that platform, it was about 25,000, so a quarter of that. And uh, that was analyzed within two and a half hours. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, there are so many people that just, you know, they want to pass time, they count penguins. As Thomas swaps out the trail cameras, two teams are busy elsewhere on the island, satellite tagging birds. Here's Robin Long. So putting the satellite device on, I'm starting by putting on a, a template putting the template on the bird's back nicely along her spine so that it's central and it doesn't disturb her drag when she's swimming in the water. And then we have this special teaser tape all the way from Germany which gets stickier when it's wet so we're able to lift up a little layer of feathers with a nail file and slip the tape underneath. And we do that with about six or seven pieces of overlapping tape and then put the device on the feathers and we wrap the tape back over the top of it and that holds it pretty securely. And you identified and went for a very specific bird. Can you tell me why that was? So at the moment there's a lot of non-breeding birds and juveniles hanging around starting to molt, which means that they will be sitting on land for the next three weeks or so while they lose and replace all of their feathers at once. 
So if we were to put a device on one of those birds, we would get a very accurate GPS fix for that point on Proclamation Island. It doesn't really tell us anything about where the birds are feeding prior to the molt, which is what we're trying to find out. So this bird, I saw that she was feeding her chick, and that means that she's going to keep going out for short foraging trips, like for a day or maybe several days, coming back to feed her chick. And then once the chick fledges, she'll probably go on a slightly longer trip to fatten up so that she can then come back and molt. And that's what we want to study. That pre-molt fattening trip yeah. is what you'd really like to, to learn about. Exactly, yes. So at the moment, we don't know where they go for that trip. And when you say she goes to fatten up, this is because the molting process takes a couple of weeks and she won't be able to feed at that time? Yeah, and also it's a hugely energy costly thing to do to replace all of your feathers. Imagine if you replaced all your skin and your hair and to be equivalent, probably some of your organs as well, all at the same time. That would really take a huge amount of energy. So they want to put on as much weight as possible before doing that. The penguin is also microchipped and a blood sample is collected before Dave Houston releases her back where she was scooped up. Good. She's just shuffled onto a rock and kind of shook it off, shook the whole experience off. Hopefully not the device though. <laughs> no, the device looks stuck. Sitting beside your chick. See the aerial kind of goes the same line down her tail yep, and when she's lying when she's flat in the water sitting at the surface the aerial will be sticking up nicely to uh, catch the satellites going over the team also collects swab samples from both albatrosses and penguins to screen for any viruses but there are no visible signs that anything is wrong so on the bounty islands the birds look healthy and with the latest count numbers it also looks like the population has held steadily at least since the mid-1990s. Yeah, but it's a different story on the Antipodes Islands. On the Antipodes, uh, we've got some very clear and, and reliable evidence um, that the penguin numbers have been dropping significantly, not only since the 70s, but throughout the 90s and, and 2000s. And that trend continues. Um, and we really want to find out what's what's the problem there. Why, why are the penguins doing well here? And doing really poorly in the Antipodes. The Antipodes are just 200 k's that way. I mean, for a penguin, that's no distance. The colonies are scattered around on the Antipodes, making it more difficult to count from drone images. So the final numbers aren't in yet, but it looks like they've dropped at least a third since 2011. And it may be worse. And the small Antipodes population of rockhopper penguins, a cousin of the erect crested penguin, seems to be declining faster still. This is the mystery, then. Why the difference between how these two sets of penguins are doing? Do they ever mix? And is it due to ocean conditions or how things are going on land? Because the penguins on the Antipodes breed in quite different conditions. Yeah, while both islands are free of introduced predators like mice and rats, the Antipodes themselves are very different to the bare rock bounties. They're covered in tussock and there's a clear division of real estate. Antipode and albatross breed on hilltop colonies among the tussock. The penguins are on rock slabs, caves and cliff edges beside the coast. And there are native predators around too. There are truckloads of skuas on, on the Antipodes and they take a heavy toll, especially on smaller, smaller erect crested penguin colonies. We had colonies of, of 12 breeding pairs where all the chicks were wiped out within three days by, by a single skua. So I wouldn't be surprised if the breeding success um, on the Antipodes is lower than it is here. The other thing is, um, on the Antipodes we've got topsoil, and depending on, on rainfall we have landslides and, and, and landslips, um, and particularly in 2014 a huge series of landslips devastated many of the, of the penguin colonies, which means that some of the larger colonies were fragmented into smaller colonies, which made them more susceptible to skewer attacks. But the landslips themselves aren't the, the only reason. It's, it's never just one reason. It's never that easy. Because since then, not many landslips happened, and the, the penguin numbers are still going down, uh, according to the data we have so far. Because these penguins hadn't been studied before, 
Thomas ended up with more questions than answers after the first season, like that difference in breeding time, which was a complete surprise. But they're beginning to get some clues as to what's going on. For starters, genetic analysis of the blood samples shows that these penguins don't really mix. Which means there's no gene flow between, between those two islands. So we're looking at two separate, separate populations that don't exchange. And while there are those differences on land, they don't seem to fully account for how each different population is faring. Which leaves ocean conditions. The team stayed at the Antipodes for several weeks, both years, and that allowed them to attach some GPS dive loggers and cameras onto some birds. And these tags are different to the ones that Robin was attaching earlier, right? Yeah, these dive loggers give a picture of what's happening in the penguins' daily search for food. They give really detailed information. And they show a bit of a north-south island divide. Those penguins on the north side tend to go north, don't dive as deep, and they forage during the day. But the Southsiders stayed at sea overnight and dove deeper for food. What was really missing from the camera footage, though, was big swarms of krill that Thomas had seen during his work with other penguin species. Now, they weren't able to deploy these loggers at the bounties for a comparison there because you can't stay on the islands, but they did attach those satellite tags Robin was talking about for the pre-malt feed-up study on 10 birds from both islands. And they came back with some astonishing results. Oh yeah, I've seen this data. It's really striking. Yeah, Thomas suspected that these feed-up trips would differ, but didn't expect such a pronounced difference. When you look at the map of the satellite fixes of the birds, it's like chalk and cheese. Yeah, the Antipodes penguins are travelling to find food in all kinds of directions, except north. The massive loop lines tracing their trails are like big wild child scribbles. One heads off almost 1,500 kilometres away from the island, and others travel between 400 and 500 kilometres away and cover big areas. Yeah, the bounty penguins, they're a whole different kettle of fish. Eight out of ten of them did exactly the same thing, headed east and stayed in the same spot about 300 kilometres from the islands. So do you know what the theories are as to why? Well, it's possible that there's an area of concentrated productivity in the east and northeast of the bounties. It might be related to the Bounty Trough, which is a deep ocean canyon that separates the Bounty Plateau and the Chatham Rise, and to different bodies of water mixing in this area which caused nutrients to come up and surface and and trigger the whole cascade of life from phytoplankton upwards. It's like a huge conveyor belt full of food right on their doorstep. And then the Antipodes penguins have to work harder because they don't have this local feeding hotspot? Yeah, somebody should... Tell them to head north, right? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, Thomas is also keen to find out if these differences in foraging behaviour are the same across other stages of the penguins' lives too. Like, where do they go in wintertime when they all leave the islands? Are the Antipodes birds working extra hard then too? Yeah, I guess these penguins only come to land to breed and molt, so it's just a snippet of their time. The rest of their lives are in the ocean. But still, why the decline? I mean, obviously the Antipodes Islands haven't moved, and they were able to sustain bigger populations before. Well, the short answer is we don't know. The longer answer is that the decline might be linked to warming ocean temperatures. So we think of the ocean as one big body of water, but actually it's an interconnected environment of currents and upwellings and different layers of water moving and mixing. And that's what drives productivity. Heating of the ocean impacts these currents, so it might be that the conveyor belt of nutrients from the deep that drives this productivity remains in reach of the Bounty Island penguins, but have sort of moved out of range for those nesting at the Antipodes. But because these birds breed in such remote, difficult-to-reach areas, we don't have much of a baseline of what's normal for them. Thomas has a further three years on his research plan, and he's working to solve some of these mysteries. But in the meantime, I, I take some comfort in the mystery. That there are places in New Zealand so remote that they defy proper explanation.
That was James Frankham, director of New Zealand Geographic. This episode was researched and reported by James and me, Claire Kincannon. Thanks to the people we spoke to, Dr. Thomas Mattern, Dr. Ursula Ellenberg, Robin Long and Dave Houston. Voice of Tangaroa is a joint production between RNZ's Our Changing World and New Zealand Geographic. New Zealand Geographic reporting on the Voice of Tangaroa is public interest journalism funded through New Zealand On Air. You can learn more and read the articles for free at nzgeo.com forward slash seas. The Live Ocean and Whakatupu Aotearoa Foundation sponsored some of James's travel costs. This episode was produced by James Frankham and me, with help from Ellen Rikers and Brianna Juritic. Thanks to senior producer Phil Vine for editing help. Sound engineering was by William Saunders and executive producers are James and Tim Watkin of RNZ. Original music for this series was created by the Wellington-based group Grains. And they've just released the tracks in a Voice of Tangaroa original soundtrack album. Find it where you get your music. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and family. Te nā koe i mai. Thanks so much for listening. Ko Clark and Canon aho. Ma te wa. it at that we gotta we gotta head back um it looks like it might rain later on um so these um uh s- somewhat out- outrageous uh, calls um just now is because there's a skewer just walking around between the penguins and the penguins are like 